And and you're right. What what these substances do is they actually alter your consciousness, right? And they make you feel more empowered, if you will. I remember, like you know, when I started dating, I had to drink alcohol just to get up the, you know, just, just to grab that that confidence to go speak to to somebody that I wanted to go to speak. And yeah. why would you have to do that, right? It's because yeah. your mind got, was getting numb by the substance. And yeah. uh, the problem with this is that then you, you think this will fix everything, and then you fall into the trap, right? Yeah. And, and I love the word that you use there, David, empowered, right? Because that's really what it was. And it, and it served that purpose, you know, for for as long as someone like me can make it work, right? Like I was empowered by it until, you know, like with so many of us with substance use disorder, um, it slowly over time kind of slow drips into this where it's it's no longer empowering, but it's actually taking all of your power, you know? And, and in 12 step uh, recovery settings, we use the word powerless. Uh, and, and, you know, that's really what it, what it t- turns into is it, it is, it strips you away of all of your power. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to point out again, that I, that I like the word that you use there empowered because that kind of principle or the dynamic, the, the power that it provides, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how the dynamic shift once it turns into like full blown addiction and then how that looks in recovery. I think that's uh, well stated. Yeah, so so a few things there, David. I mean, you know, you you mentioned, and for any of the listeners or, or whomever might be interested to to the idea of multi generational trauma, that's something over the last decade that we've got a ton more research on as of late. So there's a lot of stuff out there that you can look into and research to get a better understanding. But we know basically at this point, beyond a shadow of a doubt, um, that traumatic experiences become embedded essentially in DNA uh, and then pass through generations, right? And so if you look at um trends related to suicidality mental health issues substance use disorder um and trends related to ethnicity you see higher rates amongst those types of things amongst ethnicities um that that have experienced you know significant trauma throughout the history of their existence right again i mentioned native americans and it's like you know we all kind of understand what that looked like for natives um two three hundred years ago and, and how those experiences and that embedded, embedded trauma gets passed through generations, literally through DNA. And then it puts people, you know, in modern times, like, like myself or yourself or in, in these positions where it's ingrained for us to have this response to seek safety, uh, a response to protect, mm-hmm. um, and kind of emotionally and psychologically how we adapt to or respond to our environment. Um, It's crazy to think about those response mechanisms are literally developed hundreds of years back, you know, influenced by traumatic experiences hundreds of years back. From a behavioral health perspective, mental health perspective, spiritual health perspective, and our and our culture in the U.S. Um, and even to a to a varying degree from a global perspective, we're starting to sh- drift in, sh- shift into this era where there's more therapeutic backing for psychocybin, psycho uh, psychotropic uh, drug, uh, psychedelic drugs to use as a form of treatment, mental health, behavioral health, spiritual health. And, and my, my jury is still somewhat out on that, but I'm interested to watch over the next decade or so uh, because you are going to see this trend take off uh, and it be more medically and therapeutically supported, um, even to a point where we will likely have the major insurance companies covering costs associated with psychedelic treatment, right? So it becomes a, a, a sort of um, medically supported and evidence-based therapeutic modality, right? Like method to treat. Um, and, and I'm interested to see, man, like the story, like you just shared, right? Like over the next five to 10 years, um, how many more stories of those do we get where, you know, maybe people jump into it for the wrong reasons or somewhat misguided. And, and, and it's, that's a really hard, you know, that's a really hard thing to kind of therapeutically keep contained. And then you've got the medical side of it. It's, it becomes a very tricky dynamic to try and manage. And so when you're dealing with someone's health, you know, and, and more and more people engaging in those dynamics, it's going to be interested and interesting to see over the next decade or so how that really pans out and how many people are really affected positively or how many more people have experiences similar to yours. And, you know, for me, after my whole experience and, you know, 
Mark my words, I will never touch any substance that will alter my mind anymore. Because what I have realized is that I was looking for God in the wrong places. Yeah, I love that. That's what it is, brother. If you think about it, what you're trying to do is look for your creator in the wrong place. If you know, it's almost like you have a car and you need to fix the car. And instead of, instead of taking it to the mechanic or to the manufacturer who made it, you take it to a, you know, a, a, a washing machine repairman or to somebody mm. that knows how to repair a blender. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know? well, well, <laughs> yeah, well, said, man. It, again, it kind of harkens back to the, to the word empower. Right. If, if we're looking at God, like, again, in a 12 step recovery sense, you know, we use the term higher power um, and encourage people to call it whatever they want. But ultimately, we're talking about a power. Right. Like people are seeking power. Um, I, too, call it God. Right. Uh, you know, call it source, whatever. But ultimately, people are looking to connect and be influenced and driven by something more powerful, something bigger. Right. And, and so, again, I can tell you from my own experience, uh, a, a shot of heroin feels very empowering very powerful yeah. right so your point looking for that power and in, in the wrong spots like never ultimately over a long period of time and ultimately being fulfilled empowered um and and so to your point like again uh that's in my experience and in my belief that's you, you said it really well that's what people are doing is looking to be empowered looking to be fulfilled looking to feel whole and they're doing it in all of the wrong places and then you know i'll speak for me and, and i kind of get the sense that some of this is true for you also i looked in enough of the wrong places that i eventually got to a place where i only had one other place to look The eye opener was my doctor with, with the whole pancreatic thing. I also developed anemia because I was, I took the intermittent fasting to such extreme because I don't know if that happened to you, but when you're under psychedelics, like I was, you even stop having appetite. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah. I was eating once a day and you know, like, like I, I, were, I was only having 1500 calories a day and I needed at least 2500 calories a day. Yeah. So the anemia was so extreme that they put me on an IV, like they gave me iron right away. Like right after I went to see the doctor, I'm like, what's going on? Like, you know, I don't feel bad. Right. And I was literally dying. So when I went to that place where I said, I can no longer do this on my own. I thought I had all the answers and I don't. I am, I am done. I like, I, I don't know what else to do. When you're in that place of surrender and you said, Lord, please help me. You know you're there and you can help me. That's when my, my shift happened. And that's when the light started to shine in my life. And mm -hmm. That's when I realized that I was looking for him in the wrong places. And the desert was horrible. You know, the desert was a year of, a year of discovering what's the right way to live. After I, you know, after I thought I had it all figured out, you know, I, I, I turned 50 years old last year, now I'm 51 and I'm like, I'm still realizing that I had no idea how to live this life that was given to me.